Welcome, everyone. My name is Diana Sinton, and I am the Executive Director of UCGIS, the University Consortium for Geographic Information Science. Welcome to the first in our series for the 2019-2020 academic year of webinars. Our, uh, our very first presenter is going to be um, Dan Streeb, and we're going to be starting in just another minute or two as uh, we give people a chance to log in. So stay tuned. We'll start up again in about one minute with the content. As a reminder, your uh, microphones will remain muted for the duration of the formal presentation. <coughs> the best thing to do to be able to ask a question um, during the Q&A part of this presentation is to write a question out in the question space or the chat space that you might see there. Uh, and we will be keeping track of these and we will be able to um, get to them at the end of the session. If you have any technical problems uh, during this, you can try to send me a message there in the uh, chat space too. And there might, I might be able to do something to troubleshoot it for you, but we found that the um, easiest and uh, most efficient way to troubleshoot things is to log out and come back in. The old fashioned control alt delete method. Okay, I see a bunch of people just joining us right now. So we will go ahead and get started. It is my um, pleasure today to welcome um, Dan Streeb as our first presenter during this webinar series. Dan is extremely well known for his prowess as a cartographer, especially with a expertise in map projections. He um, works both with map, thematic, map thematics, and you can go to that website and see um, Geocarto, and also uh, works in Seattle with Tableau Software. So. With that, I'm going to, Dan, I'm going to switch the um, presenter to you, and you will be able to proceed on your own. Hello there. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yep, they can. Hello, it's coming through. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Senton, for inviting me to speak. It's a, it's a pleasure to address students, faculty, friends of UCGIS. Uh, I'm not sure anyone has ever bothered to try to turn map projections into a, a meandering social exploration, but here we are, and here I will go. Uh, map projections are an odd topic for a lot of reasons. One of those reasons is that it's really kind of two distinct topics large-scale projections versus small-scale scale projections. And people often reverse the meanings because the terminology sometimes seems counterintuitive. Um, so let me give a refresher. If you're showing a large part of the globe, that's small-scale. If you're showing a small part of the globe, that's large-scale. In the large-scale maps, you don't have to worry much about the curvature of the Earth. It's such a tiny portion that uh, it might as well be flat. And anyway, uh, you know, the hills and valleys could easily dominate the curvature. Large-scale projections are a mess. They're a mess for historical and technological reasons that resulted in hundreds of different coordinate systems in use around the world. And for UGIS people, just look at all those EPSG codes and, and you'll get a feel for what kind of mess it is. So let's say you're reading a hiking map. You're probably not going to notice the problem there. Um, it's mostly a problem for the map maker, not the map reader. But sometimes your GPS and your map might disagree on where you are, um, you know, depending on when and where your map was made. And then that's when it can become your mess. Small scale projections are for world maps, hemispheres, large continents, maps of entire planets. Uh, 
so it's in those circumstances where the Earth's curvature gets so intense that you, you really just cannot ignore it. Small scale projections are a mess. Uh, they're a mess because they have to be. That was proved by uh, the famous mathematician Carl Gauss in 1828. You can't flatten that sphere uh, without distorting it. Distortion makes messes, and they're the kind of messes that you can easily see on any world map. So why then am I interested in something that's inherently a mess? Maybe you shouldn't ask that. But however it happened, here I am, and today we're going to talk mostly about those small scale map projections. Which are what, really? You can probably all remember fifth grade geography and some book that showed a light shining through a globe onto a cylinder or a cone or a wall, and there you have a map projection. Or maybe you had a really cool teacher who did that for real. You probably all know that's not really how map projections work. And of course, you know this because in eighth grade geography, some book showed you the analogy of peeling an orange. And you were clever and immediately thought, aha, peeling an orange is nothing like shining a light through a globe. This is all just some hand waving and blathering to cover up the fact that it's actually a lot more complicated. And so it is. Speaking of eighth grade, here's what a weird little boy does when he can't find a map projection that he likes. He makes one up. This is my first of what has become very many projections. And you know, I mean, it's simplistic, but much later on, I learned that this was a real projection that appeared in a real map projection literature as Max Eckert's first projection. And 70 years before, I got impatient with my choices in Mr. Hutchison's geography class. This business of shining a light through a globe, you can do that and you'll get what I call a literal projection, but most of the time that projection isn't going to be useful. And sure, you can paint a map onto the skin of an orange and then peel it off and flatten it. That is a projection too, but it's going to be a different projection every time you do it. The real point here is that these intuitive methods just don't even begin to cover the real range of possibilities. Here's the real range of possibilities. This is sort of a, a populist view, meaning that if you've had high school algebra, this might mean something to you. Differential geometers get pretty fancy in uh, how they represent this stuff, but this is what it boils down to. You need an x-coordinate, you need a y-coordinate, you have a latitude phi, you have a longitude lambda, given latitude and longitude, there's some function that gives you x and some other function that gives you y. And that's it, those two functions F and G, they can be pretty much anything. Of course, this is really general, whereas the universe of useful projections is a lot smaller. But the point is whether you're dealing with this or this, either way, it's just this. It's all about that F and G. Okay, well, how many F and Gs have actually been used? In other words, how many map projections are there out there? If you are talking about just anyone who's ever sketched out a map on a napkin or wrote some buggy computer program, I'd have to guess millions. If you're talking about deliberate concoctions, maybe a few thousand of which maybe a thousand have been described in some formal way. Well, why so many? Well, remember everyone owns a mess. So depending on what you're doing, you might be able to put up with some kinds of mess and not other kinds. If you have a thematic map, you probably want something equal area and you're less concerned if shapes are all bent up. If you want to show distances from someplace, you don't care if shapes are right or areas are right, this is what you need. Maybe you want rums to be straight because it's the 19th century and you're sailing. Maybe you want to focus on land masses and you want the relative sizes to be right, but you don't care so much about the oceans and the fact that you're emphasizing the separateness of the continents and so on and so forth. Most of the time for a general reference map of the world, it's about aesthetics. Which do you like better? Sometimes it's about egos or even about social political statements. Sometimes, 
a world map is, you know, has a specific enough purpose that you can narrow down your choices a lot. I'm going to show you a, a clip from National Geographic. It's an animation that I did from them that explains how they arrived at the choice of a particular projection for a particular map. You don't often see a world map like this, but it's one of the best ways to highlight the oceans. There's no perfect way to put a round planet on a flat map. Something is going to be distorted. Cartographers have peeled the globe in many different ways, and each has its own advantage. The famous Mercator projection from the 16th century was great for sea navigation, but Greenland looks bigger than Africa, even though Africa is 14 times larger. A German mathematician named Karl Mulvaidi created an elliptical projection. You can't use it for navigation, but it accurately compares land areas. Pull the oceans apart, and land areas lie even flatter on the page and are even more accurate in shape. For our map of the ocean floor, we used an interrupted Mulvaidi centered on the Pacific and divided the land rather than the seas. The three main oceans are shown in their entirety with the least distortion possible. When I first dove deeply into map projections, that was uh, 1988. I, you know, I kind of thought there'd be some nice quiet pocket of nerdiness that an introverted guy like me could just sort of wallow in without having to care about the messiness of real people. Well, it turned out that was really pretty naive, naive of me. Uh, after a year or two of study and programming of these map projections, it's gradually sunk into my consciousness that I was living right in the middle of the biggest controversy in map projections ever. Well, how do map projections become controversial? You know, this kind of thing happens a lot with ideologues in academics. There was just an awful lot of noise about what seemed like a pretty small matter to me. My talk isn't about that controversy specifically, but to show how these things end up facing the public, let's turn to a clip from a West Wing episode. You may well have seen this. Mm, I have to get out of full screen here. The video you're about to see is the most serious. Hi, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry to be late. No problem. I'm CJ Craig. Of course you are. I'm Dr. John Fallow, Dr. Cynthia Sales, and uh, Professor Donald Huke. Huke? Huke. Okay, and you are the Organization of Cartographers for Social Equality. Well, we're, uh, we're from the OCSE. We have many members. How many? 4,300 dues-paying members. What are the dues? $20 a year for the newsletter. Let's start. Wait. Wait, I want to see this. This is Josh Lyman. Indeed you are. Josh, this is Dr. Fallow, and Hi. I do some merry men. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Should we begin? Yes. Plain and simple. Uh, We'd like President Bartlett to aggressively support legislation that would make it mandatory for every public school in America to teach geography using the Peters projection map instead of the traditional Mercator. Give me 200 bucks and it's done. Really? No. Why aren't we changing maps? Uh, because, CJ, the Mercator projection has fostered European imperialist attitudes for centuries and created an ethnic bias against the Third World. Really? The German cartographer Mercator originally designed this map in 1569 as a navigational tool for European sailors. The map enlarges areas at the poles to create straight lines of constant bearing or geographic direction. So it makes it easier to cross an ocean. But yes. it distorts the relative size of nations and continents. Are you saying the map is wrong? Oh dear, yes. Now look at Greenland. Okay. Now look at Africa. Okay. The two land masses appear to be roughly the same size. Yes. Blow your mind, I told you that Africa is in reality 14 times larger. Yes. Here we have Europe drawn considerably larger than South America. When it's 6.9 million square miles, South America is almost double the size of Europe's 3.8 million. Alaska, 
appears three times as large as Mexico, when Mexico is larger by 0.1 million square miles. Germany appears in the middle of the map when it's in the northernmost quarter of the Earth. Wait, wait, wait. Relative size is one thing, but you're telling me that Germany isn't where we think it is? I think it's where you think it is. Where is it? I'm glad you asked. The Peters Projection. It has fidelity of axis. Fidelity of position. East-west lines are parallel and intersect north-south axes at right angles. What the hell is that? It's where you've been living this whole time. Should we continue? Uh-huh. So, you're probably wondering what all of this has to do with social equality. No, I'm wondering where France really is. Guys, we want to thank you very much for coming in. Hang on, we're going to finish this. Okay. What do maps have to do with social equality, you ask? She asked. Salvatore Natoli of the National Council for Social Studies argues, in our society, we unconsciously equate size with importance and even power. I'm going to check in on Tommy. Go. These guys find Brigadoon on that map, you'll call me, right? Probably not. Okay. When third world countries are misrepresented, they're likely to be valued less. When Mercator maps exaggerate the importance of Western civilization, when the top of the map is given to the Northern Hemisphere, and the bottom is given to the Southern, then people will tend to adopt top and bottom attitudes. But wait, how? Where else could you put the Northern Hemisphere but on the top? On the bottom. How? Like this? Yeah, but you can't do that. Why not? Because it's freaking me out. I'm here to prove the purple mattress blood. So in its north up form, the particular map projection on display in that episode has become a, a social political statement and a symbol of a movement. You don't find those maps everywhere exactly, but they're still pretty common and uh, you only have to go online to find a lot of passionate and rhetorical dialogue about the projection. A lot of people in the educated public know about that West Wing episode and it seems like map projections have managed to worm their way into the consciousness of at least, uh, you know, the geekier segments of society. If you ever doubted that, all you have to do is check out Randall Monroe's XKCD comic. He's got this kind of funny synthesis of uh, psychology and map projection here. I found uh, an older and graphically inventive twist in a cartoon by the celebrated Montreal cartoonist Jacques Goldstein. This was, um, this was published as a poster for a cartographic conference in the early 80s. Obviously, it never hit mainstream, but uh, the cartoon is really quite educational about how map projections distort, distort the globe. Um, given populist trends, it's probably no surprise that you can even find projections branded into people's skin. Notice that this is a, a cylindric projection on a cylindrical body part. This was a server for my lunch down at a brew pub here in Seattle. There was another one I ran into uh, on the light rail. And I've seen photos of many others, of course. Uh, and I have a story about a particular one. You know how every once in a while in your life, just out of the blue, really weird things happen, things you just couldn't predict? So this is one of those stories. Uh, I've invented a lot of map projections, but one that I'm proud of is, is this one. It's equal area, and it uses uh, a novel technique to achieve the property while fulfilling the other goals that I set for it. What I wanted to do here is to shove as much distortion as I could into the Pacific and away from the continents while still retaining symmetry and uh, an equal equatorial aspect. Well, one day, uh, maybe 10 years ago, I got a friend request on Facebook from somebody I didn't, didn't know. Um, couldn't think why I should know. She was she was young and sort of uh, you know suspiciously attractive, and once in a while these things happen, and so normally you just kind of ignore them. Um, but I did my due diligence and looked at her profile, and it turned out that she was a, a geography student. And so I thought to myself, well, okay, I, I don't I don't 
remember her, but probably met her at one of these conferences, maybe in Moscow last year or something. So uh, I accepted her friend request, and an hour later, I got a, a rather breathless message from her exclaiming that she was, uh, it was going to be her birthday in two weeks. And she'd been searching for the past year for uh, the perfect map projection for a tattoo on her back. Well, I, I really didn't know what to think about that. Um, tattoos aren't exactly my generation's thing. Uh, when I was growing up, tattoos were something that sailors had. Uh, and maybe, maybe you'd see kind of wild photos of uh, punk rockers or something with some tattoos. And, and really that was about it. Um, so, I mean, I knew that people were getting a lot of tattoos these days and I'm fine with that. I don't have any myself, but it was still a little disconcerting and I really didn't know what to think about somebody wanting uh, my projection as a tattoo. But I felt like I ought to be supportive. And in any case, she had talked to her thesis advisor who, who knew me and her thesis advisor was all excited about this and suggested that she contact me. And so that's how she happened to get a hold of me. And so I, uh, I wrote back and said, well, I, that's it's great that you found that you were looking for. Um, and, you know, happy birthday in advance. Let me know if there's anything I can do to help. And so she wrote back very quickly again saying, yeah, actually, um, I talked to the tattoo artist and and uh, he wants a, a higher resolution image, which I found pretty surprising because, uh, you know, you can have a little tattoo on the small of your back or something. You you probably don't need a lot of detail. So I said, sure, I can, I can get you something in PDF format. That'll be as detailed as you want to blow it up to be. Let me know if you want any other changes. And she assured me, no, no, it was all good the way it was, just needed to be more detailed. So I sent that off to her. Uh, two weeks later, she sends me two photos. One was a before and the other was a in progress photo. And I, I just cannot even convey how mortified I was. She had, you know, a perfectly fine back before and then this in progress, it was about halfway through, her back was all just puffed up and bloody and red and I, I I just, all I could think to myself was, what have I done? Fortunately, about a week or two later, she sent another photo that had it, uh, you know, all cleared out. And uh, I, I was able to come to, to terms a little better with the whole thing. But um, still, it was it was pretty trying for me. And then about a year later, my brother calls and he says, dude, I have this great coffee table book. You should get it. I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. He doesn't call me about coffee table books. He said, no, but you, you should get this one, really. It's, it's, um, it's a book about science tattoos. And I said, oh? He said, yeah, yeah, you should just get it. So and he said, and check out the uh, book review in the New York Times. So here, here it is in all its glory. Notice that uh, Marina's explanation for this is that uh, it's organic in shape and she appreciates that it's Afrocentric and not Euro or American centric. I'll talk a little bit more about that later, I think. So anyway, yeah, uh, weird things. Now, what's this about Google? You might know that Google Maps uses the Mercator projection. There's been a lot of chatter in the cartographic community about that because it's, you know, it's, it's controversial. How is it controversial? Well, think back to that West Wing episode. Basically, an upstart named Arno Peters, who was an amateur historian from Germany, decided that uh, you know centuries of European cartographers were all in some conspiracy to show the world on Mercator maps. And the reason that he alleged for this conspiracy was to puff up their own countries so that they were comparatively a lot larger than they really were, and thereby make their colonial possessions, which were you know largely in the tropics, appear smaller in comparison. Um, so on this map, those two circles actually contain the same amount of surface area on the globe, but it, obviously it's a lot larger on the Mercator. And the further north you go, the bigger that circle is going to get. Um, so distilled, Peters' claim was that the Mercator is, is racist and imperialistic. But the funny thing is that cartographers themselves had already been wringing their hands for a century by that time over how publishers were misusing the Mercator. 
So this attack obviously wasn't going to endear them. And of course, it didn't help that the solution that Peters came up with was not only not original, uh, it was pretty ugly by most cartographers' standards. Cartographers also had a list of grievances about the rest of Peters' claims, and so they more or less went to war against the Peters industry. That was in the late 80s, right when I began my lifetime avocation in map projections, still blissfully oblivious to the controversy. So fast forward to the present. You'll find that it's pretty much dogma among cartographers that the Mercator is evil. And while not many cartographers ever embraced Peters' criticisms, nor his solution, what they did do was sort of um, defensively fortify their own distaste for the Mercator. I have to think they did this to distance themselves from the claims that Peters had made. And so when cartographers began to realize that Google Maps was based on the Mercator and that Google Maps was basically taking over everything, uh, a lot of them got kind of sad or disgusted or outraged about that. And maybe, maybe, maybe the response they had depended on the personality type. You can ask Randall Monroe about that. And so anyway, this belief that Google perpetuates a, a horrible solution is, is common among cartographers, at least the ones I keep running into. I don't think that the cartographers are wrong exactly, but I don't think they're right exactly. Now, to be clear, uh, it's not just the cartographers who are up in arms about Google Mercator, it's also the geodesists, but their complaint is completely different. Geodesy is the study of measuring the Earth's surface and includes, for example, surveying. Now these geodesists, they don't care. They don't care about the area disproportion because they don't generally deal with the whole earth at once. What they care about is that the web maps Mercator isn't really the Mercator. By geodesic dogma, the formulas that Google should be using need to be a lot more complicated in order for it to be the real Mercator because the Google maps Mercator uh, version doesn't con consider the, uh, the ellipsoidal shape of the earth, it's only the spherical shape. And so, by using what the geodesists think of as the wrong formula, the Google Mercator isn't conformal and doesn't match what they do. Now, okay, technically they're right, uh, but I don't really think that's the point. Google Maps doesn't need to be truly conformal and it's not worth the complexity to make it truly conformal. Maybe those ellipsoidal formulas down at the bottom don't look like they're that much more complicated, but even just with what I'm showing here, they're about three times as costly to compute. That's not actually the biggest problem. The biggest problem is going backward from X or Y to latitude. X is easy, of course, but Y. So there's no direct formula for that. You have to go through this complicated uh, iterative root finder. And so my own back of the envelope calculation suggests that a, a truly conformal version would cost on the order of seriously, tens of millions of dollars a year in extra electricity for the calculation uh, at the scale of Google. And that's not to mention all the time and money that have to be wasted on supporting all these third party programmers who, you know, they're not generally used to dealing with simple numerical problems, let alone complicated ones. And so I would have to think that the distributed cost in bugs and confusion would just be gigantic. And plus there's all the, you know, the environmental costs of all that electricity waste. And it's all would just be for no practical benefit. So anyway, back to the cartographers, their complaint is that uh, Google ought to have used some other pre projection that isn't so disproportionate, preferably an equal area projection. Now, that idea would be unassailable for a static map at world scale, but I wonder if they understand what they're giving up to get that in a variable scale setting for like slippy maps and online service and so on. The simple fact is that the Mercator looks right everywhere if you just restrict yourself to looking at some small area. If you pay attention to the scale bar here on this Google Maps Mercator, I'm going to flip through three images and you can if you look at the scale bar at the lower right, you can watch the scale bar change. So I haven't zoomed in at all. All I've done is change the position on the globe to go further north and you can see that the scale bar has changed and that's all you have to do to get the Mercator to, to be right for a local area. If you want to keep north straight up, no matter where you're on the map, and if you don't want to change projections while you pan around just to keep things looking right, then your solution is the Mercator. It's the only projection that can do all of those things. Meanwhile, here's what happens if you try to use an equal area projection. You have to change projections constantly as you glide around. 
this, that's because you can see that the squished circle at the left on the top, that becomes the almost circle at the center on the bottom. It's the same location on the globe, but it's not the same pixels. So doing something like this would be really expensive at the scale of Google's operation because you can't just cache an array of static tiles like you can with the Mercator. You have to render the base image every single time you move the focus of attention. And when you zoom out, you also have you also end up favoring some particular locale, which leaves every place else all twisted up and misshapen. Is that really better than the Mercator? I I don't think so, especially if you're mostly about uh, traffic maps where you're at a very tiny locale and the projection that you choose isn't really that important as long as you're showing everything correctly locally. So I think that those Google engineers made the best choice they could, and you can use it with confidence for a lot of purposes, but you have to recognize the hazards. Don't use it for world maps. Don't use it for data visualization across large areas. Don't use it for anything that has to include the poles, and so on. So. Obviously, Google Maps is everywhere, and it has all that free infrastructure and tooling built up around it. And so certainly the cartographers are right when they complain that it's very availability sort of uh, entices people to use the wrong projection to display their data. I mean, here's, here's an example of a, just a tragically uninformed map of North Korean missile ranges. The problem here is that the longer ranges just they're not going to be circles on Google's Mercator projection. They're not even going to be close to circles. In fact, it's going to be a wavy line across the top of the map. And so this map turns out to be complete fiction. Lots of other cartographic narratives have just been grossly warped by having been grafted onto Google Maps willy-nilly. And we're talking about usually without the map maker even realizing what a mess it became. And, you know, that's a shame, but I think that the problem calls for alternatives rather than for you know, blaming Google just because people can use their maps. Now, maybe some of you whom I'm addressing right now, maybe you'll become part of the solution. Google itself has started giving an alternative. It so happens that uh, as of last year, uh, Google displays its vector maps on the perspective projection instead of um, the Mercator if you're running on a desktop computer uh, as you zoom out of the map. So watch what goes on here. You can see that right now it looks fairly Mercatorish, but as we zoom out, lines are getting curved. And then by the time we reach hemispheric level, you can see that it, it really is a perspective. Now, so this perspective that I'm showing you is basically the same view you'd have from a high altitude. There's still a huge amount of distortion around the edges of the the projection when you when you zoom out, that's just the way reality is, but at least it looks natural. And what's the Achilles heel? Why isn't this the best world map ever? Well, it's not a world map. It's a hemisphere map and you can only see half of the earth at most. So what if you wanna see it all? Well, as GIS practitioners, you normally you're constrained in what you can responsibly do with your projection. If you're an artist though, you have a lot more freedom. Earlier, we saw how Jacques Goldstein explained map projections by cartoon. We saw tattoos. Now, in Marina's explanation for her choice of tattoos, she gives philosophical reasons, but I, I kind of wonder if more than any of that, her choice was aesthetic. You can see how the top of the projection curves around her neck and how, in general, the shape fits the space. So here's a little gallery I put together for uh, a Pachakcha-style talk at a cartographic conference some years ago. Uh, and it was subsequently published in the, the, the uh, organization's journal. So the thing about these images is that none of them were constructed to be art. They're just graphical representations of, of mathematics. I think an artist could do a lot more with the subject. And, you know, not surprisingly, some have. I worked on a project in the mid 90s with uh, the artist couple Leela Locurto and Bill Altkult. Um, this project culminated in a national tour called selfportrait.map. And here are some pieces from that. 
part of the description from their work reads, working with state-of-the-art full body scanner that uses lasers to collect thousands of surface points from the body, Bocurto and Outcult process this digital data through cartography software written specially for their project. Such imaging, known as projection, is used to create topographical maps. By mapping their own bodies instead of land masses via a variety of projection models, Locurto and Outcult reference numerous art, historical, and scientific modes of representation, issues of veracity, and the transformations technology has wrought on our lives. Selfportrait.map looks at the digital reordering of three-dimensional forms through a reshaping of the digitized body and offers an alternative way of representing the human figure by remapping its surface onto a set of simple shapes. The fragility and tenuous nature of our existence is a recurring theme in the artist's work and in the process of unfolding the scans, the computer generated a complex network of jagged seams and torn edges. Although stitching utilities exist that allow the projections to be repaired, Locurto and Outcult considered the holes and gaps to be evocative of both the land masses of maps and the vulnerability of life. Now, maybe the grotesque forms that the artists were willing to project their bodies into make you uncomfortable. Maybe they repel you. But hopefully, having taken Picasso's agenda to its logical conclusion, they at least make you think. Here you can see how uh, Peter Bruegel the Elder in the mid 16th century turned practically the entire background of some of his paintings into landscape maps. Those maps are not ad hoc. You would recognize their projections as perspectives. The per perspective projection is just one of the many hundreds that you saw in this cornucopia. And it's the same projection Google has switched to for its desktop maps as we just saw. Bruegel worked with perspectives, but his friend uh, Abraham Ortelius needed to show far more of the earth than a perspective could. So more than 400 years ago, Ortelius experimented with many projections and he helped popularize some of the projections and presentations similar to what we still use today. See this Robinson here on the bottom? Uh, this is one of the most popular projections for world maps these days, but you can see how uh, Ortelius obviously influenced it. So anyway, beyond the mere technicalities, Ortelius, Bruegel, Mercator, who was another of Ortelius' friends, by the way, uh, and hundreds of other map makers of the early modern period thought of their maps as artistic canvases for presenting metaphor. By the 1800s, that function of maps had largely gone out of style in favor of more utilitarian design. And I sort of think that GIS is, I sort of think of GIS as being the culmination of that utilitarianism. Maybe though, maybe we're coming full circle. Cartographic academic Alexander Kent remarks on how the utility of online maps has pushed cartographers back into the business of aesthetics for the sake of aesthetics. We just may be living in a time when a lot of fields have to evolve toward these more human expressions as utilitarian functions become more automated. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, let's open this up to questions if we have time, Diane. We do. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. That was, I, I was wondering, uh, I'd forgotten about that New York Times um, picture of, uh, of that map projection. And I was wondering for a while where that particular story was going to be going. I was um, <laughs> hoping I wasn't going to have to all of a sudden, uh, I didn't want to see the the, bat, the mid, glad, really glad you didn't show the intermediate stage of that. Um, <laughs> so we have had some, uh, some some callers call in with questions. I feel like I'm, um, I'm hosting a radio show here. Uh, while we turn to these, if anyone has any question they would like to ask Dan, can you please type it into your question space? Um, we will get to as many as we can with the time that we have and, uh, and follow up otherwise with any ones we can't get to. But um, I've, uh, we have someone who's called in from Southern California who's uh, wondering right now, um, with your particular equal area uh, map that was tattooed onto that curved body, did it still stay equal area? Technically, no, but the deviation from equal area is not large. I would think probably under 5%. And I guess that would, it would um, kind of vary across the back. 
It right. would, and it also depends on exactly what the tattoo artist did in order to transfer it. It is possible for it to be perfectly equal area, but I, I can't imagine that the tattoo artist took that kind of uh, care. And of course, uh, people's bodies change over time. And so even if it went on perfectly equal area, it would not be. <laughs> <laughs> That's a problem with aging bodies. Your tattoos will not remain equal area. We can that probably figure the, out the, the math of that, the math of that over time. <laughs> um, all right, we have another question also from a particular uh, classroom in Lewis Hall at the University of Redlands campus. Go Bulldogs. Um, someone in Redlands is also wondering, uh, what's, uh, Dan, what is your favorite map projection for measuring distances between different pairs of cities? Uh, if we're talking about a world map projection, I don't have one because they're all extremely bad for that. You simply shouldn't do that on a world map, period. There is none that can work. If we're talking about um, in a more local sense for a continent or something, uh, the usual ones in play that are used for national maps are generally pretty good that way. You can use a Lambert conformal for something for the continental US. Uh, and you'll get distances that are, you know, pretty close. But there is no there is no map projection that will preserve distances between arbitrary points. It doesn't exist. And I think that's one of the a, a very um, enduring and persistent difficult things for people to understand because uh, GIS really lends itself when people see points on a map, they want to be able to really quickly um, choose an appropriate projection to be able to measure that. Uh, and and measure and not understand that you, you can't look at all of the different points that you're looking at in your map and and figure out all of their distances consistently. Well, it's and totally insidious, Diana. I, I you know people use GIS in misuse GIS in ways that actually affect people, and it's pretty unfortunate. Those GIS packages, um, the better ones, they're capable of doing computations on the sphere, but people they don't do it by default. They do it on your projected space. And so we have circumstances where, for example, the government of France has been charging, you know, these marginal family farmers. They've been overtaxing them for many years because they've been doing the, the area calculations for their farm uh, holdings on the projected space instead of on spherical space. And so in the area of France, this resulted in basically a 15% increase in the estimate of the area that they were paying taxes on. And I, those people, they can't afford that. Wow, I, I had never heard that before. That's a, it's not common to be able to come up with a really specific example like that of, especially in, um, with that kind of, uh, you know, it, measurable economic impact of, of, of a bad rejection choice. Um, well, the horrifying thing is, I suppose if I actually poked into it more deeply, actually went looking for this, I would find it all over the place because as far as I can tell, most of the people who are using GIS really are always working on projected space. And that's just not appropriate. Uh, yeah. So what do you, when you, uh, when you hear, when you see that and you know that it's happening all around you all day long, like it probably happened in my nine o'clock in the morning GIS class today, do you um, just, uh, you know, so you're a little bit like the West Wing, um, it's a little bit of West Wing-esque in life, you know, what, what does one do? What does one do when we see the ubiquity of maps, uh, ubiquity of GIS-based maps expand everywhere? Uh, um, and, and that there are a a fraction of people in the world who understand all of the reasons why these errors are propagated throughout, what does, what do you do? Does it keep you up at night? Well, you know, I, I sort of vacillate between cynical and hopeful. The position that I'm in right now, I, I technically I work for Tableau, uh, Tableau software. They are not sponsoring this particularly other than in the sense that it is a work day today and I'm taking time off of work to do this. But one of the reasons I'm there is because, you know, Tableau is, is visualization software. And uh, unfortunately, the only projection that we support natively in Tableau is the, 
the web mercator because they started out with that 10 years ago or whatever. And unfortunately, that is the absolute worst projection that could be used for data visualization. And so part of my function there, uh, as I see it, is to help transition the entire infrastructure away from that so that we can actually do responsible visualizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's a small start with Tableau. What about with GIS in general? And I mean, it's not as if there are many um, GIS professionals and GIS faculty and GIS students who are aware of these things on a, on a conceptual technical level but maybe not be consistent in their application of it or, um, who, or people who always take the time to do the research necessary, not just with projections, but also with whatever, you know, other datums and coordinate systems might be contributing to problems in a particular place. So, uh, yeah, there's no answer. It's just a complicated, it's a complicated well, situation. So it is complicated, and that's exactly what, what I was going to reinforce. It is complicated. Projections are, are in a funny valley between cartography and, and mathematics, and it's a, a very sparsely populated valley. Um, and I don't, I, I'm not unre so unrealistic as to think that everybody should become experts in map projections, even people who are using GIS or doing cartography. That's simply not the case. Most cartographers uh, are more sort of a graphic arts background or graphic design okay. background it is, okay. and uh, they need to be in order to produce good maps. Um, so, and mathematicians on the other hand, they are, you know, they're highly abstract. They don't really care about the silly details of mapping actual planets or anything like that. And so map projections are basically the redheaded stepchild of both cartography and mathematics. And in order to solve the kinds of problems that I'm describing about these, these misuses of projection, more has to be done on the side of the people who are giving the tools out or selling the tools. They need to be responsible in what they're doing and how they're doing it. And their defaults can't be encouraging people to do bad things. And they need to build more intelligence into their tools so that when they detect bad things happening, it, it has to be brought to the attention of the person doing the work. Mm -hmm. So saving people from themselves. Well, saving people from a difficult domain that they shouldn't really have to spend the rest of their life trying to grapple with. Yes, right, right. Um, can you comment any more on about what you do at Tableau? We're not trying to get into company secrets here, but how do you? Um, what are you optimistic that you uh, might be able to? Uh, help with in the next few years, if I may. Is it, is it that area that you're describing to build in um, prompts or ways to, uh, as you're going down a particular path of um, a visualization path, that it's going to put in stops or prompts or something? Well, right now I'm, I'm basically focused on retooling the infrastructure so that we can we can support other projections. Mm -hmm. And once we can support other projections, then we can then we can help our customers develop the most appropriate visualization for their data. In general, that's going to mean an equal area projection because uh, most of the data that people want to display have has meaning on uh, in terms of density of phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And if you're talking about density of phenomenon, you simply have to use an equal area projection in order to view it correctly. Um. So equal area seems to uh, be one of the more straightforward, or, or you would say that that's, that's the, the across most use cases, that would be a higher priority. But what about, um, what about the role of things that require distance? You know, I'm thinking about all the times that buffers are used, all the times that routing is done to estimate t uh, time travel. Uh, you that know, in fact is all of, Right. And that's yeah. exactly the case. And so one of the things that I'm working on as well is uh, transitioning all of the cal cal calculations that we do in that regard onto the spheroid instead of off of the instead of on the projection. So it'll display it'll display on whatever projection it displays on, but the calculations that will tell you the distance or that will give you the uh, the visualization based on distance will actually be the true distance, not the projected distance. Mm. Okay. All right. What um, 
Oh, someone has asked a question about the use of 3D models. Uh, I'm not quite sure the full focus of, of this particular question, but it has, I guess this individual is looking at some differences between um, uh, maybe 3D models that are being projected in 2.5 pseudo 3D space, the way that you were showing us, um, the way that Google Maps now goes out to a, to a hemispheric projection. But maybe just comment a little bit on some of these uh, decisions and compromises between, you know, our an actual use of a globe, uh, uh, or or three D models instead of um, flat maps. Right. So the the paradox there is that while a globe has, you know, virtually perfect fidelity, uh, your visual plane is flat. And so even looking at a globe, you're seeing a lot of distortion. Right in your line of sight, uh, if you're looking at the point the closest to you on the globe, there is no distortion, but uh, everything away from that is distorted and gets more and more distorted. And so what a globe is, is good for is for teaching you what things are supposed to look like because your visual system is built to compensate for that distortion to a fair extent. And so you can spin this globe in front of you and you can look at things when they are closest to you and most comfortable for you to look at. You can see them in the way they're supposed to be. And you can get that same effect, of course, on a computer screen. You don't have to have a physical globe to do that, but you do need to be cognizant that you're still seeing a lot of distortion. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to view a particular region of the Earth, as long as you're not talking about the entire Earth, if you want to view a particular region of Earth with the lowest amount of distortion, that globe view is not it. Right. Uh, so it's... Um, so it's really better... Uh, I'm sorry, I was distracting trying to read through the next line of questions that are coming in right now towards mm -hmm. the end of, of your response here. So um, you're saying that there's still uh, uh, the idea that it, trying to make a 3D model that's that you, you might someone might pursue a 3D model because it, their their sense is that it's um, that it's more true, that it's truer to the uh, to an authentic globe representation. But there's so many things about the way that our, our vision is going to be perceiving things that it's still not worth it's better just to pick an appropriate projection for a for a, a flat space that's right i think a, a three you know pseudo 3d view uh, is is useful it is cognitively useful but I, you should not rely on that as your primary visualization field because of the fact that it's not going to give you the least distortion and it certainly is okay. not equal, certainly is not equal area right so what would what if you were doing that, what what would be the appropriate map projection to use for a map that you were but that you were going to do like that? If it were a world map, and I needed to do any sort of data visualization that involved density measure, uh, it, honestly, it just doesn't matter what equal area map. Any of them will will be grossly wrong because any world map is grossly wrong. But at least the area will be correct, and so the densities will be correct. So that okay. all important density metric is not going to get distorted. It's interesting that the density metric, maybe it's the nature of the data that you're working with at Tableau so much that the density metric has such a high um, priority, such a such a high import fa importance factor. Well, people do a lot of things that end up being density, maybe without necessarily realizing it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to show a heat map of a phenomenon, for example, uh, in the end, that's density. And mm -hmm. the simple the simple truth is, if you want to show a heat map across a large swath of the Earth, if you're not using an equal area map, you're you're just showing a fiction. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that there are people out there listening to this. Uh, they're going to be thinking uh, carefully about all the different choices that they're that they're making in their projects. <laughs> well, it's difficult, especially the topic of heat maps is difficult because there's a lot of software is not going to do it correctly, even on an equal area map, because they're doing their their yes. uh, aggregation in the projected space. Uh, 
Yes. Um, yeah. So, I've, I've, yeah. There was a heat map. There was I can't remember what it was. There was a few years ago. There was a a, a web map tool that um, let people uh, generate heat maps just with a couple of clicks, and they ended up having to take it take it down after uh, a few months because so many um, GIS and you know cartography people in general uh, were able to explain to them that that you weren't giving people any. Um, capacity to change any of their parameters and generating these uh, whatever that you know kernel density functions and they were just making a bunch of garbage in there so yeah that's the unfortunate reality of a good fraction of the output of visualization tools and I, I don't know how to emphasize that enough to people but you know on the other hand people often simply don't really care I don't mm. think that there, there's some fraction of the customers that I deal with who probably don't really care about the accuracy. They simply want a tool to support the narrative that they, they need to generate. Yeah. Tool to support narratives they want to generate. <laughs> uh Oh, Sharpie markers. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, Hey, Dan, thank you so very much for your time. I really appreciate hearing your comments on this and the stories that you've had to share. It's been I, I hope we maybe we'll get another chance another time to be able to hear some more thoughts as you're um, as you continue your exciting work at Tableau. I hope so. Thank you so much, um, Dan. You're very welcome. And for all of you listening, thank you for spending an hour with us here at this first of our 2019-2020 series. Uh, this has been recorded and um, sometime in the next day or so, uh, you'll be able to access that recording. You'll get a link in your email and feel free to share that with your colleagues. Um, thank you again, everyone. And uh, we're gonna sign off now. Enjoy your afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye.